values uh, or cultures, what is the uh, basis of our uh, daily life together, but also of what unites us. Facing this situation, the uh, EU uh, gave a very uh, quick answer. Sorry, I'm going to be a little technical. Uh, first, we uh, actually, uh, through the uh, European uh, Bank, uh, we uh, actually did uh, an increase in capital for SMEs and uh, proposals uh, to support uh, short time uh, working schemes, you know, for people to be able to uh, face this situation. The Commission also uh, decided to take very concrete and sectorial measures through um, instruments that uh, already uh, existed. Uh, the media program uh, it was adapted to the most urgent needs, and uh, we are presently uh, studying an extra emergency aid uh, for the most affected sectors. Then we did a guarantee uh, fund, uh, and uh, this was a, a tool implemented in 2016. Very successful, more than 2,000 projects were funded. And uh, with the European Fund of Investment, we also are adapting it uh, to make it even uh, more attractive and competitive, uh, and most of all, uh, in the present situation. And uh, then uh, the Commission uh, keeps defending the uh, program, defending culture in uh, the uh, forthcoming uh, European uh, budget we're studying at the moment. And uh, you can accountably actually increase those budgets. A few words now on the recovery plans. Obviously, uh, audiovisual and media industries will benefit the recovery plan. Uh, I recall you that a few weeks ago, the Commission uh, put together a historical plan, both in its structure and its uh, importance. It was 750 million euros, and uh, it was uh, also uh, given uh, the uh, possibility for uh, the Commission to be uh, present, just as one had. And uh, people actually said this was an historical uh, moment. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, we are living what I would call in a Miltonian moment, uh, in, uh, the name of this uh, economist who was so important in the construction of the United States. That might be a little excessive, but I think there's some of it. I mean, uh, we are going to um, create dates that on a solidarity principle. This money should concretely answer the comment we actually did assess them, we tried to identify as much as possible the one was direct subsidies in order to actually help immediately who had suffered. And then we are starting to work on long term loans. I am, you know, one of the people who is actually pushing up subsidies, but I think loans are also important. So to give us the possibility to reinvent ourselves. I mean, uh, you know, we have to think about what we're doing and we also have to foresee in a way uh, how, uh, you know, this uh, crisis and about it could give us the opportunity to rethink the impact of uh, the digital uh, technology and uh, the way our environment can be affected through the uh, green pact and also thinking about the resilience, one of the important axes of work of the commission. 
beyond the structures and uh, the figures that I was put is quite concentrate on the issues for the fourth uh, the first thing is uh, how can you use our strength uh, to have a system, uh, but also to transform it. And this is where I really invite you, and we are going to work together. But I strongly invite you to reflect uh, because. This uh, gives us the opportunity to reinvent our economy and the system of natural and creative industries in Europe. In order to use this unprecedented situation to actually try to accompany and anticipate the possible transformation. Uh, I can uh, give you a few concrete examples. First, uh, we need uh, to invest for a better connected Europe, the whole territory of Europe. Uh, obviously, uh, it's about our broadband system, and uh, we saw that during this period, uh, it was interesting to work uh, with uh, the network. And I myself asked uh, where those networks going to support all the connections. And uh, we've seen how the networks were important for the whole territory, for the statistics. Millions of people living in Europe actually have a Access. We spoke about uh, 5G, a digital associated technology in order to uh, make it a uh, broadcast uh, of some kind of pipeline for content. Uh, Europe has uh, always been very demanding quality of its creation, uh, uh, inspired by its uh, auteur cinema. Uh, we now have to take all the efforts, we have to integrate the digital technologies to uh, uh, the content, uh, obviously. The uh, great distribution platform actually has shown the uh, enormous audience uh, but uh, that shows in a way that uh, we are in the uh, middle of a uh, control. Uh, obviously, uh, we have to find our place in the world while. Uh, Preserving central uh, for you and for us, uh, preserving our rights and our intellectual property uh, without the intellectual properties, uh, you know, what would uh, our liberty to uh, I think it, it would be, uh, you know, at the medium and long term, a risk uh, for our uh, intellectual liberty. So to reinforce this, we have to give our industry to finance uh, quality productions, to promote ambitious uh, productions, uh, whether in film or in television, uh, in order to uh, be distributed in uh, the uh, widest territory as possible. Obviously, we, we thought uh, first about new creators in Europe, but also uh, in, in, in words, but we want to uh, give uh, European people to have access to our content, but also uh, people worldwide to have access to our content. And uh, I once again want to reassure you that I want to work with you. Uh, this project will have to use uh, the uh, potential of the uh, Technologies, uh, uh, digital, uh, virtual reality, special effects, but it should also uh, structure a cooperation between, between creators, authors, and uh, the uh, technologies. 
you know, there are um, many uh, firms in Europe, but uh, we can uh, find uh, some sort of platform to be able to uh, really um, think together and uh, speak about all this. What we need now is uh, to build up things from the proposals coming from the players of the ecosystem in order to accompany this digital position of your system in the uh, creation uh, and distribution of contents. And uh, I would say that all the uh, directorate that are under my responsibilities can help you. And uh, we uh, are going to give ourselves the financial means uh, to uh, really do uh, projects that can help us to structure. And uh, obviously, the Europe Creative Program uh, will uh, keep supporting actively European cooperation and uh, uh, the viability of your uh, ecosystem. Uh, one last point I would like to make is about digital platforms. Uh, we uh, cannot uh, leave or exit this crisis uh, with an industry that has been uh, weakened. Um, I know that uh, we, uh, with all my uh, colleague commissioners, we're trying to uh, make the competition uh, fairer. It is obviously a way of uh, serving, being more assertive of who we are, also to reaffirm our independence. Uh, uh, you, uh, you know, our line is really about uh, It is the line of the, the uh, Jobson and Lion Commission. Uh, uh, one question that we ask, I think it's a legitimate. Uh, so, uh, what about uh, the uh, Google, Amazon, etc.? I don't see Europe uh, We are the first industrial continent, and that means a lot of uh, capacities, a lot of assets, and I thought for a safeguard plan and investment that would be similar to the one uh, that has been implemented on other continents. Europe is where culture and the movies were born, uh, and uh, it's actually amplified. Our fellow citizens uh, are absolutely conscious of the fact that we need to be more resilient, more autonomous, uh, and also need to be very firm on our ambition. And uh, we need to be sure that, I would say that uh, the crisis in a way accelerated this tendency. I believe that uh, thanks to what we've done, it gives us a new momentum, a new start, I would say, uh, to our common action. More with this crisis, we, uh, see the emergence and it is something that is new. This is something I wanted to share with you uh, with uh, naivety. But see uh, some kind of consciousness of those uh, digital platforms of the role they have in our societies. If you can't see it, I will recall this to them and uh, I will recall this with their obligations and responsibilities. Uh, during uh, all this confinement uh, period, uh, I was in uh, touch with the majority of the great platforms, and uh, I spoke uh, with a lot of them. I want to say that, uh, you know, um, that there are some new forwards that we can really imagine. For uh, the crisis, it is about governance. There are two choices: the soft one and the hard one.
So I would say that we can negotiate, we can have conversations. I'm one of the people who would like to see what can be obtained through conversations. So we will try. I forwards for the uh, uh, by some platforms and uh, the effort would be continued. Uh, I would say that people uh, feel uh, of the conversation I had with Something. It is a platform that has to adapt to us in Europe, to the European market, uh, and to what we are, obviously. And uh, our values, I think we're very, very attached to our values in Europe, uh, because these values are the basis uh, of uh, share things and not the contrary and as you know uh, we are trying to think about how we could regulate things and i think it is the appropriate uh, moment to have this conversation about a new governance that could be uh, better fitted to what we are uh, each one each player has got to take uh, its responsibility i would say the platforms have a very clear responsibility uh, because of uh, their positions of gatekeeper i know them all very very well you know uh, thanks to my uh, uh, former uh, professional wife and uh, uh, i think uh, we have to speak about this responsibility uh, we have to think about taxes uh, and uh, also uh, content uh, is also so an agenda, a, a regulatory agenda, and uh, there are steps ahead of us. Next month, the uh, guideline of uh, the uh, audiovisual and uh, the way things are uh, going to uh, be calculated, you know, the services, then uh, we are going to work on the guideline of the article uh, 17 uh, about uh, the copyright directive, the cooperation of the platforms of contents and uh, the right orders. And, uh, uh, then uh, we have other important uh, because we will present at the end of the year the user uh, with a view to increasing uh, the responsibility of platforms in uh, all the um, economic activities. Uh, so there will be a wide uh, Conversation and I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it would be, you know, I, I strongly uh, ask you to, to participate. I mean, the way your uh, insight would be important. Those regulatory uh, measures are obviously uh, key to get an equal. Uh, competition between all the players, but obviously a legislation is never enough to preserve a uh, cultural and linguistic diversity and a cultural severity. Uh, we all know that we also uh, need, and you know it better than I, need an investment, we need ambitious investment. Work, but also investments in the technology, but also in the skills and in the digital skills, uh, because your sector uh, is uh, in evolution. The skills uh, also changes, and that means a lot of work for all the people involved in the value chain, and uh, this is. Uh, uh, Actually, my ambition is actually to put forward an ambitious uh, 
program uh, for the whole uh, European Commission and the European Union. Ambition, together, solidarity, no naivety, fair, understanding the coming world voilà. and being able to embrace it and it's this is the work we have to do together uh, uh, you can obviously count on me 100 uh, percent to actually speak with you but also to build together Uh, et puis, um, the framework of the shared vision, but uh, uh, you can also count on me to fight uh, pour, for the means to be there, because uh, it's uh, obvious uh, that, uh, you know, for this to be orchestrated, uh, people quote uh, Jean Monnet quite a lot, uh, but they don't, uh, in the right way, and he was say, speaking about the European project, uh, we uh, do not colonize states, but you, you white people, you are the men and women of uh, this cultural sector, uh, you represent this sector, and uh, this uh, sector is uh, very precious. I could even say it's the most precious thing to build this common project to represent the diversity that gives the strength of our culture all over our continent. So that's it. This is, I wanted to reaffirm that during all my mandate, I will be together with you for you uh, sector to get out Merci. of this crisis much stronger than it was Thank together. Thank you very Thanks much, very much, Commissioner Breton. This sets quite the scene for the upcoming uh, panel discussion. We're going to dive in in a few uh, minutes. But before we do so, without being naive, being agile and resilient, we're going to hear from the perspective of the European Parliament with its chair of the Culture Committee and me, Sabine Ferreyen. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you very much, dear Commissioner Breton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to speak to you today and thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Commissioner Breton, for your introductory remarks. I try to keep myself short because our cult committee will meet at five o'clock and we have to vote on some important issues. Uh, but I would like to take this chance to speak about the enormous impact in this crisis has on the film sector, but also on the whole cultural and creative sector. In the cultural sector, we have seen cinemas, big concert halls and small venues, theaters, museums close their door. Many festivals, conferences, book fairs, and films and television productions have been canceled or at least postponed until further notice. We need to protect and support our cultural and creative sectors and the people making up these industries. Nevertheless, these sectors are facing ruin and the European Union still needs to do much more and to do it much more quickly. We have adopted substantial aid packages, notably the Coronavirus Response Investment Initiative through the structural funds, but the often small business and individuals making up these sectors take one look at the mass of paperwork and run a mile, or they do not fit to the conditions set out in the programs. We need to tailor support to those people who help them access that support. We also need, without delay, Uh, to boost and adapt the cultural and creative sectors. Guarantee facility under Creative Europe to help the sector access further financing. And we need dedicated support to the media and the film sector. The Committee on Culture and Education will continue to push for the right measures to be delivered quickly. Now we need to ensure that these sectors will be properly represented in the recovery plans. Spending money on culture and cultural education is investing in the future of the continent. And let's use this opportunity to redefine our priorities. 
As many of us have spent several weeks at home, it cannot be escaped us how fundamental culture is to us. Whether it, it be watching a film, listening to music, enjoying an online museum tour, or simply reading a book, culture matters so much to our everyday life. If today we do not support our artists, creators, actors, and professionals working in those sectors, it may have devastating consequences for cultural diversity and mean that we simply will not have access to the range of cultural content and expressions we do now. The creative and cultural industries account for over 4% of the EU GDP and employ over 7 million people. Jobs and income of artists, especially freelancers, and even the survival of many cultural institutions is threatened. The shooting of films and series has been stopped and the long-term closure of that industry would be disastrous for Europe. Its cultural identity and its competitiveness in a global market dominated by American content. Also, the European film industry has been very much affected by the crisis. Productions have been stopped, film releases were not possible, and festivals had to be cancelled. And even though we are lucky to live in the digital era, we have alternative formats such as video conferencing. I think we can all agree that it is not the same. No video conferencing tool in the world can replace the Cannes Film Festival. As those film festivals are true celebrations of the European film scene. When we negotiate the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, we spoke a lot about the importance of cultural diversity and the richness of our European film sector. And we were successful in introducing 30% quota for European works on streaming platforms in order to safeguard this European diversity and protect our European audiovisual market. Implementation is now key and we hope all member states will do their best to quickly transpose the rules in their national law with the help of the implementing guidelines from the Commission. Looking forward, we need to ensure that the people making up the sector, the artists, creators, but also the people working behind the scenes and on set have a future and can take on the giant global platforms. In short, we need to create the conditions for our vibrant cultural and creative sector to recover the thrive. However, and this needs to be crystal clear, will not come without costs. We need to invest in the cultural sector now and if we miss this opportunity, the losses will be immense. As chair of the cult committee, I'm deeply concerned about the Commission's proposal of the budget and recovery plan. I'm aware that there is really much to praise in the Commission's plan generally, but when looking at the details and what it means, especially for the cultural and creative sector, the picture is a different one. The specific figures for the cultural media programs are deeply disappointing. All figures are far below the Commission's original 2018 proposal for the 2021-27 budget. The Creative Europe program, of which the media program is an essential part, will not be increased in this very unfortunate that the Commission is proposing lower numbers compared to its original proposals two years ago. We have created expectations that are not met by the proposal, which is now on the table. We need earmarked support out of the Next Generation Recovery Fund for the cultural creative sectors and decision makers need finally take their specific needs seriously. The Committee on Culture and Education demands a budget for these particular fields for the next seven year budget period by adapting our priorities on regional, national and European level. And we have urged the Commission to balance the obvious needs to focus the budget on the crisis and the post-crisis recovery with the ongoing need to invest in these programs that support our cultural, creative and media sectors. And for many years, the Committee on Culture and Education has um, bemoaned a lack of budgetary ambition for those programs. They achieve a great deal on a, re a relative shoestring. Any money taken from the cultural programs would have a devastating impact on the sectors and yet yield only a drop in the ocean of the broader post-COVID-19 recovery. While we fully recognize about many parts of the EU budget, we must also ensure that we continue to deliver effective programs that support our creators and artists. And this is a key plank of the EU post-crisis recovery. If you could get out of the recovery plan, the value the cultural and creative sectors brings to our GDP, 
as part and support for the cultural and creative sector in our media, I think we would be a step forward. Let's all pull together on this, the industry, the artists, people in creative jobs, filmmakers, the sector, the parliament, the commission and the member states' governments. We need to work together now to absorb and mitigate the ev evasion of the crisis on the sector. And it's crucial for our cultural diversity and creative richness in Europe. We have to protect our diversity and we have to do it in a sufficient manner. And many thanks for your attention. And thank you very, very much indeed to you, Amip, uh, uh, for uh, those words and perspective. We'll let you run to your next meeting if I understand well, and if I do understand too, but the discussion are still going on between the European Parliament and the Commission. And yeah, it's going to be a tough one. But we're here actually to dive into the discussion with those who are crafting those incredible industries and ecosystems. When it comes to audiovisual, we are so glad to welcome today here at the European Film Forum Online, Daniela Etzner, you're the Director General for Unifrance here in Paris. Also with us, Ed Guinea, the CEO of Hello. Elemental. If you have admired the lobster or the favorite, this is the man who's been working behind closed doors to actually make those incredible movie happen. Tasha Binet, the CEO of Media Pro, is also with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And last but definitely not the least, the president of the European Producers Club since 2015, Marco Kimens, also the CEO of Catalea responsible for the incredible fictions, Gomorra, Subura, and Cero, Cero, Cero. Welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen, to this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now, actually, um, we are going to dive into this question. Of course, you're going to have uh, the chance to ask your questions directly to our panel by the end of the discussion. To do so, just post your question below the video, either on Vimeo or on YouTube, and you have to be a registered member of the Marché du Film to do so. But again, I'll do my best to your professor here at the European Film Forum. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's get on to it. And, well, we have a lot to discuss, apparently. Um, and yes, this crisis has been quite devastating for all of you. And um, now, I guess you might have missed feelings uh, about what happened three months as some who are actually producing um, fiction and, and cinema. And yes, actually, and it's an example here in Paris too, um, cinema theaters have been reopening since midnight. But for some of you too, on the other end, you've been also producing a lot of different series um, and even for platforms. And that's a plus because, I mean, guess what? Online consumption has been booming over the past three months. So just to start the discussion here, I would like to have at in a glimpse, just you know, one um, one one word about where you're standing and where you're standing right now. Marco, for instance, you are producing both for the cinema and also for platforms. Are you happy um, to recover from this period? What's your what's your feeling? Like? Well, we are uh, well. Thank you for inviting me to this um, panel. I listened to uh, Commissaire Breton's. Um, opening speech uh, very carefully. Um, Marjorie, just one thing, I'm, I'm not president of the European, um, the EPC anymore. I'm a member of the board that we had uh, uh, change a couple of years ago. Uh, but look, um, it's obvious uh, for the perspective of my company, uh, on one side, we're lucky. Uh, we are lucky that we transition from uh, producing predominantly almost exclusively until a few years ago feature films for theatrical distribution to a situation now where we still do a few films every year but our bulk of um, output is um, TV series and, and say I'm lucky because um, um, on our theatrical um, um, producing film producing business uh, of course uh, the uncertainty is huge. Um, cinemas have just reopened in Italy, but uh, how many people are going? Whereas on the TV drama side, of course, as you just said, uh, the platforms uh, are booming, the subscription and, and etc. 
And so the demand is still very, very high. Absolutely. And that's definitely something paradoxical. Let me remind you some facts and figure out there. Um, before the lockdown in Europe, actually, um, by February 2020, the consumption in theaters, cinema theaters, set a new record in Europe with 1.34 billion viewers, which was massive at the time. And then three months later, guess what? SVOD platforms have never been so popular. Netflix doubles down its viewers number for the first quarter of 2020, setting a new record when it comes to platforms to 183 million users worldwide. And this is 16 million subscribers. Um, more uh, from January to March in 2020. So um, yes, um, Ed, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your feelings right now. I mean, you've been the producer and you've been crafting so many beautiful uh, movies uh, behind the scenes, The Lobster again, or um, The Favorite. Um, what are, is your feeling right now? Do you think that we can recover uh, the audiovisual ecosystem from um, these times? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very optimistic about it. Ultimately, I think that um, I think that you know, once uh, coronavirus passes, which it will do, none of us know how long that will take. Uh, I guess we are optimistic that it will be sooner rather than later. Um, but I think people will really relish uh, the communal experience that the cinema offers and I think people will people I think one of the things about isolation of course is that that that, uh, that people have been watching a lot more um, at home on television etc but I, I also think that increases a hunger to be back out and have a communal experience so I'm very optimistic about that um, in the long term I also feel that um, there's a real opportunity in cinema now I think that um, the connection between cinema and television is a very strong one and i think that one of the things that we've seen recently is that television has really upped its game and there have been some incredible um television series made uh, at europe and all around the world um recently i'm a particular fan of gamara's uh, 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 made by our colleague here um but but i also think that that in a way inspires cinema to do better if that makes sense i think that because the bar is raised so high i think that people who work in cinema need to um provide audiences with a real reason to leave their homes and go to the cinema and i think we're moving into a world where that is increasingly popular i, I increasingly positive i think if you look at the last year you've seen some extraordinary films i mean i don't need to mention parasite uh uh, to this group, but that is a game changer. You see a foreign language film becoming a massive hit internationally and winning the Oscars. And I think that suggests that there's a huge appetite among audiences, cinema audiences, to see things that are different um, uh, from diverse voices. And I think that um, we are brilliantly positioned in Europe to respond to that um, demand. Uh, you know, Europe is all about diversity. I think we could be much better at diversity, by the way, but Europe by its nature is about diversity, uh, about voices from different nationalities coming together. Um, and I think that there is a hunger in cinema for um, big, bold, audacious films. Um, and I would love to see more of those films come out of Europe in the future. I think we should be ambitious about our cinema um, and ambitious about the impact that it can make on the world definitely set the ambitions high so that we can actually have a return on investment if I follow you quite closely. And as uh, Commissioner Breton is still with us um, um, attending the panel, uh, I would like for um, Daniela and, and Tasho to um, jump in the discussion too uh, about actually the investment as a driver, as the driver. Can we actually invest in more diversity so that we can set new values for Europe when it comes to the audiovisual uh, ecosystem? And also, by the way, um, what other drivers, what other elements can be powerful drivers for, for investing into our ecosystems? And I love the fact that we're actually for the very first time here at the European Film Forum using the word ecosystem and not really industries, because yes, we're definitely an ecosystem and we have to come as one to um, recover from 
these uh, grim times. Daniela, can I have a perspective on your side and on the Unifrance members? Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, first of all, I think something that we are we really should mention is that it's not only Europe that is going through this crisis, but the whole world. So uh, while listening to Commissioner, Commissioner Breton, I think there are a few words and like, they are very important, which means ambitious, being together, solidarity, less naive, and being um, having a vision of the future. So what I, what Unifrance discovered also, and I discovered over the last month, is the more we will work together, the better it will be. And we have to be ambitious because we are we have a chance in Europe to be diverse, to have many talents. We have everything. We have script writers, we have directors, we have producers, sales agents, we know how to do it. So now what we need is to get all together. And I think we have to put our strengths together. And uh, Ed, I'm very thankful what you just said because I think we already have proven that Europe can produce ambitious films, but we also can produce very independent films. So we have to use all of it, push it further, and maybe set a little bit alongside our national issues and uh, taking it really from a European side. Because when you think of it, like what is not right now, someone, uh, Sabine Verheyden said that a uh, video conference is of course less good than the actual Cannes Film Festival, but also maybe watching a film at home, sometimes alone, even platform or TV, is a quite different experience than being in a theater. And if you are in a theater as a European citizen watching a European film, um, there is something that unites us suddenly all together in the screening room. So I, I really think we have also a huge chance right now for this we need um, what Sabine Lehane just said, we need money because without it, it will not be possible to relaunch because we are all at uh, moment zero. Um, so we need money, but we also need to sit all together like what we are actually now doing and rethinking, reshaping our business models and not excluding one or the other platform versus cinema, but we have to think together. And I think for me, it's really solidarity is one of the upcoming words that we need to think about. Yeah, it's definitely more about being together in an addition than trying to uh, get one of the side out of uh, the question or the perspective to have a proper reshape and reboot of the audiovisual ecosystem. Thank you so much for that, Daniela. Um, and um, I'm going to steal actually some words from Anadella, the CEO of Microsoft, saying that we've just been living two years of digital transformation in only two months. And that makes a total change when it comes to distributing or even reaching to audiences when you're a filmmaker, right? Or when you're a producer. Um, Tasho, um, when it comes to Media Pro, of course, you're one of the most prominent um, leading group in the European audiovisual sector, and you have this unique way of managing integration, production, and audiovisual pr um, distribution. What is your take on what we've just uh, said about investing more in European content? Would that make a difference? Well yeah well uh i don't know where to start with maybe i can start with the the effect of the of the crisis of the cob we had to stop uh, we had time 48 projects on production we had to stop 24 of them that we have to they are not cancelled they're just stopped and we managed to continue with with 24 projects on during the during the confination and the reason of we could do that is because we are such a diversified company that with all the different uh, divisions of the company helping each other. And for instance, we created a real-time studio-based dubbing system to be used by those actors who were in self-isolation uh, and whose voices were compulsory to finish films and series that we needed to launch. Basically, the actors were dubbing each one from his own home. We are now commercializing this, uh, this, this, this project and we call it ADRA, A-D-R-A-H, that comes from additional dialogue replacement for actors at home. So I think that this is a, something that, that advances us and something that, that, that the, this crisis can, can bring to the, new, to the new world. Regarding the, the, 
what happens with the independent creators in 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 Europe either for films or for TV series? We can talk more about TV series also to produce uh, some films, and I think that we produce very quality, high quality films. But I think the two most important things are first thing the, the investment to fit better in the digital market, and second, an appropriate regulatory framework. Uh, but these two things, they are all resume in one. Our main asset as a producer is IP, and is as much I IP as we can get and keep from our series or from our films and our stories. Keeping this IP is terribly difficult as we face international organizations with incredible economic power. The way the market works in Spain, and I think that it works in almost the whole Europe, is the international platform and also the national broadcasters oblige us to give them all the IP if we want to sell our TV series to them. Sometimes I watch series that have been conceived and produced by us, our name is poorly mentioned, if, if mentioned at all. So I think that this is the, the, where the regulatory has to enter. We need the, 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 the regulatory to recognize who is the creator of the IP. And people in Europe would be very surprised if they really who, has created, who really has created these magnificent TV series that they are, that they say that it's uh, produced by this pl American platform. Okay. Which is definitely a strong proposition here, uh, Tasho. Uh, I know that Commissioner Breton is still listening to us. I'm probably going to offer him um, an opportunity to uh, to answer the IP question. And it was, of course, one of the strong message of uh, your uh, keynote speech uh, uh, some minutes ago, Commissioner Breton. Uh, the idea that we need to fight for more uh, crucial, uh, we need to fight more fiercely on the IP side when it comes to be smarter are the regulation we want to impel on uh, platform players. Um, do you have a specific comment on, on, on this proposition by, by Tasho and the other members of the panel? I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I, I, don't, I can I'm see him. But... I, bet. I, I think Commissioner Breton has left. I'm so sorry about that. Yes. I could still call him actually Maybe on my preview. Like, like my speech. Here. There you go. So now we can have the answer for ourselves. That's fine. Anyways, yeah, I mean, VIP is definitely one of um, of the angles of the discussion we have to tackle at some point. So let's open a more um, open a more um, inclusive discussion about the IP. We have a Tasho uh, proposition when it comes to uh, being stronger on the IP side of it. What would be your thought, Marco, um, Ed, and and um, Danielle, of course, on on this matter? Marco, I think you're muted. I... That's the part where I'm having technical, you know, problems. And I'm, I'm oh, happy yeah, you have to, to attend this part. Okay, I'm Marco, go. Recurring. No, I was just saying I could not agree more with Tasco. I mean, uh, he said it very um, uh, clearly. Uh, we have to consider that we have in front of us organizations and uh, that are worth, that currently capitalize some of them over a trillion dollar. Um, so they have resources that have never been seen in, in, in our industry. Of course, they're not planning to spend all their resources in the audiovisual industries but they have uh, huge pockets. Now, when I hear that uh, Europe or European Union is thinking of how to create a European champion in the sense of uh, digital distribution, I always wonder whether this really makes sense because uh, the competition is um, unachievable, as simple as, simple as that the train to create a European champion in terms of a streaming venture uh, of audiovisual content, that train, if we ever had that train, that train is long gone. The only, I think, platforms 
um, that, that still has a chance to compete is Spotify and music. But audiovisual, I'm sorry, we don't have that. However, we have an industry, or sounds better, I agree, an ecosystem that is very vibrant, that is very vital, and that has uh, a lot of very interesting uh, independent producers, production groups, uh, distribution groups, a wealth of talents, writers, actors, directors, and uh, a passion for um, our, our own cultures. And I think that we have to capitalize on this. So rather than um, try to emulate uh, groups where we don't really have resources for that, I think we should, again, as Tasco was saying, uh, be very, very careful of what's happening on the ground and try to create a regulatory framework where European independent producers can work with the streamers or with the local networks. Because frankly, Marjorie, I don't want to criminalize the, the streamers. We all do a lot of work with them, but they come from... Uh, come from uh, uh, most of their executives come from the studios and come with uh, a mentality where uh, they are the commission entity and they have a regular relationship with the talent the producer in itself the production company is normally a, a professional figure that is uh, for hire and is not so central in the uh, creation of the system we have to uh, make sure that these platforms, as well, again, as Tasco was saying, the current broadcasters, I mean, private and public broadcasters, put European independent producers at the center. Why? Because I think we are um, what is as close as possible to what had been the Armani, the Valentino, the Louis Vuitton, meaning the designer that had created the based on their ability to um, model uh, art and, and commerce uh, to create industry. And then these industry, these companies have been acquired, but have com contributed to the growth and to the prestige of Europe. And I think this should be exactly the same. Without the regulatory, very tight regulatory framework, there is no way that the network or a streamer that capitalizes uh, trillions of dollars then is at, at all interested in leaving uh, um, a piece of the IP to the producers that have created it, that has created it, or to uh, remunerate his work in a way that he can gradually grow his company. Uh, so I think this is the main thing. And the co coronavirus crisis, in my view, has not really changed the terms of the problem, has just accelerated the exponentially the transition from a world to another. But we would have got there regardless of the virus. So, uh, so we're now there and we need to have the European Commission to work fast on how to um, adjust to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, two years in the, of digital transformation turned to two months over the COVID crisis. So we have to act fast if we want to transition to this new uh, time and era uh, with European values and with making sure the fact that we as an ecosystem can actually make a difference uh, at a global scale. But still, don't you think that, I mean, Commissioner Breton was talking about discussing fast and then regulating if we can do much more with the discussion part of it. Do you think that the other pieces of regulation have been band-aids, let's put it this way, um, to try to cope with, uh, with the, the global players? Do you think we should do more um, on, on this area, Ed and, and uh, Daniela, maybe? Um, I mean, I have a slightly different perspective on it. Um, I understand the need for regulation, but I think there's a big opportunity for European producers at the moment. Um, there's a worldwide explosion in demand for content. There are huge numbers of buyers out there looking to acquire the very best content. And many uh, of us in Europe are making content that is 
you know, that is in huge demand. And what strikes me is the great opportunity at the moment is to properly invest in development, to properly empower European producers to develop their IP. Uh, and I think that m my perspective on the amounts of money that are available for development through Creative Europe are that they're actually very small, uh, certainly on a kind of, on on slate funding or on a project by project basis, we're not keeping up at all with the success of our creators. And so what you find is that the kind of the streamers, the international broadcasters who have very deep pockets can offer um, the creators of IP, the directors, the writers, um, huge paydays, huge development deals. Um, and, and actually the real opportunity for us as producers is for us to be able to do the same and to compete. So in other words, if we have access to proper development money, we can build these projects, we can commission the scripts, we can budget the projects, we can cast them, and then we can go out and we can choose the very best buyer for that project. And if we have a project that is in demand, we can choose the very best terms for that. And of course, there are many streamers out there, but there are also lots of public service broadcasters, old broadcasters, all of these people who really need content as well. And um, so if I had one thing to say to the Commission is to really re examine uh, their whole approach to project development um, and to mm -hmm. properly resource that, because I think if we can own the IP, then we can exploit it, we can build companies, we are in the, we're in the position to do better and better deals. And I think at the moment, we're not really independent producers, we're dependent producers. Strong words here, Ed, and your take is definitely the fact that we have to look more on the development part of any type of content we want to actually see and and then give a, give a, a screen to our wider and younger audiences too. And this is crucial right now because the usage and habits and and digital habits that have been taken by those younger generation of the past three months are not going to get back to what they were before the COVID crisis. So it's definitely crucial when it comes to um, recruiting a, a wider, um, uh, you know, and, and wider and, and younger audiences, plurals, um, to try to make a difference out there and try to really invest in the content they're craving for. And, and have a better distribution and proposition of what we can offer as an entire ecosystem here and an and, and audiovisual community, of course. But I also love the idea of Pashto, who was um, 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 teaching us a while ago uh, about the way that he totally turned into a new business model. Um, he turned actually a, a new usage into a, a new business model when it comes to um, the uh, software so that um, um, his actors can actually dub themselves from home. Can we actually think out of the box for a quick second here and see what type of business models um, would be uh, smart to invest in as Europeans um, to um, you know, make a difference again on this uh, market and global competition? Do we have any solutions out there or are we you know, still um, trying to beta test, um, to use a very high tech uh, type of, uh, of web, um, type of, of new solution that we can offer to the ecosystem. Can I just. Sure, Daniel. I, I, I just wanted to add one word, maybe also to, uh, to the regulation. I think mm -hmm. um, I totally agree with Ed um, that we have to be free, creative, and inventive, but we also need the regulation at one point, uh, especially uh, with the AVMSD uh, directive. Um, we have to go forward because what you say about let's have new business models, let's change maybe our sites. I think there's a huge possibility of reshaping our business models for sure. But what also came out of the crisis is that actually um, our, our European creativity, um, what we know, how, when we know how to do it, um, and also I think the theater as itself has also, it, it has been felt as we missed something during crisis, we could not go there. So now it's reopening and we will see the first figures, but I think there's also um, a, a new positive way of thinking about this cinema going experience. So um, I think we have to shape our business models. What I think is very important is that we think out of the box for to be what I said before together also for co-production there are huge 
possibilities in Europe to co-produce. And I think we have to reinforce this. And I could not more agree that producers need to get support right now so that they can be in Europe strong enough for then go and somehow attract the platforms and the bigger money, but to be uh, owner, as we all said, of their films. So I think our new business model might be somehow sh being, being shaped out of the, fo the former one, but in a new way. And I think this is really important. And I think we really have to see that we have to do it together here in Europe. Yeah, the new way being collective, if I hear you clearly, Daniela. Yeah, I think this is very important. So do, do you guys think we've been playing way too solo as uh, European state members uh, for so long? And uh, how can we actually be more collective uh, players at the European level to uh, take it to the next level when it comes to audiences and, and content consumption? So me personally, I think that there is a lot of collaboration between, between different countries and different um, producers and creators around, around Europe. I don't think that this is a problem. Uh, I hope that the regulation doesn't stop that. I hope that the regulation of media uh, not, is not preventing that, but accelerating it. I have my doubts anyway. Uh, but I think that uh, on, on, this, on this world, and don't get me wrong with what I said before, we are in an expansive uh, ecosystem. The, the, Series and content production is booming and will be booming after the crisis. In fact, we have today 30, 33 more projects that we had at the beginning of the crisis. So the demand for content is, is strong and, and huge. And there's a lot of hunger for the platforms and the broadcasters to buy new content. The, but we have to see a little bit in the future because uh, if we do not maintain the independent producers and, and that, that most of the time, as he was saying, as I was saying, we're not independent producers because we produce it for someone else. And so, but, but if, if we don't want that in the very next future, all the productions are made by algorithms uh, owned by the, these big platforms, we have to regulate some way. And the reason why we're trying to take it um, um, as an holistic type of approach here in Europe, trying to really think about the way that those digital players are also content players and the way we can actually work them better if it's going through regulation um, or if it's going through a discussion indeed. Um, so I would like to have also your, your take on the idea, again, to try to attract more um, business models here uh, um, and to recover from this crisis. We're talking about investing in, in, in European content, but there is also another new motto, if you may, here at the European Commission now, which is being a greener um, Europe. Um, and uh, I was um, actually um, curious about the fact that um, how we could actually make this industry more sustainable and, and benefit from the greener movement uh, of all industries and, you know, shaking every single sector out here in Europe. Can we actually invest in a more sustainable um, audiovisual industry um, to make a difference again? Uh, Marjorie, I think, I think we have to. Uh, I mean, as uh, someone said earlier, I think we have one of the things that, that we have learned from this uh, virus crisis is how interconnected the world is. If we really needed another lesson at that, uh, the European Producer Club has approved um, a charter um, um, for uh, green production. Uh, is it easy to abide to that charter? It is not. It's, it is cer certainly more time consuming and expensive. Is that an area where the commission may decide to invest on and relieve part of those additional costs? I would say certainly yes. I think also, sorry, Marjorie, just going a, a, a step sure. back uh, and, and, and try to um, 
um, to take a, a page from what Ed was just saying, the development money. I think that it's, uh, it, it is right. I mean, I think that it's uh, the more leverage you have with the streamer, or with the broadcaster, or with any commissioning entity, and the more chances uh, you have to obtain a better deal. Uh, keep a hold of or share of the um, intellectual property and be remunerated uh, in a more sub substantial, significant way so that you can then offset the loss in development that you make every year or the projects that uh, do not go necessarily well. Um, I will actually push this a step forward, maybe, uh, meaning that uh, I think there is a need at a European level, not necessarily to rethink uh, the business model, but to think whether it would be uh, interesting and beneficial to the whole industry to not simply just invest in development money for high-end productions, films or TV series, but also to come in almost as an equity investor or in combination with some uh, private equity investors to um, finance part of the gap. Uh, in Europe, um, uh, in continental Europe and Ireland for sure, and uh, we can certainly produce very high quality projects with uh, much less money that uh, um, it comes from, that it's necessary in the US. Um, still, to produce a four or five million euro uh, per episode uh, TV series. You certainly need uh, several actors, uh, pay TVs, local pay TVs to step in, some of the more established um, international sales company. And you, may, you may still actually have a, a, a gap. If that gap, gap could be covered uh, by uh, a public fund, uh, which doesn't necessarily have to give uh, grants, it could be loans, returnable, uh, some kind of revolving system that we have seen over and over in the private sector. Uh, I think that could be a very interesting um, uh, interesting idea. Um, again, uh, as uh, the, a producer who could count on part of their financing coming from that grant, from, from a fund like that, then could, be, could have more leverage when dealing with the broadcasters or with the streamers. Um, and, uh, and again, it's all about leverage. It's all about creating great stories, of course, uh, first off, but also having leverage when you have uh, a big uh, entity in front of you to be able to extract um, a good deal. So I think that's another thing that um, should be taken into consideration. Um, you know, the European Producer Club represents small companies and large companies, but there is certainly a need to help the small company, but also uh, not to help the big companies, but to um, focus uh, some and invest some energies uh, to, and, and put together two or three large uh, European uh, entities and, and, and make them able to finance uh, uh, you know, some of these um, I know, properties that can really represent the best of Europe uh, and that can uh, then make uh, our actors and actresses known around the world and, uh, something that, and then the whole industry can uh, capitalize on. Well, looking into uh, as many diverse um, investing instruments as, or financial instruments as possible was definitely on the table when you listened to um, Commissioner Breton's uh, keynote speech uh, a while ago. So I guess that he would be more than happy to have your thoughts on which kind of uh, financial instrument we can use for better use. It can be loans, of course, can be investments, it can be a, a lot of other ideas out there. But yeah, I mean, we need to get better, better financement to actually make this happen, of course. And Ed, I keep on seeing you nodding on what uh, Marco just said. Uh, can you dive into it for a few seconds for me? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with what Mark was saying. And I feel that Europe, we are a bit unambitious about the possibilities for our industry at the European level. And that actually, I think that a lot of the supports that are available are um, more useful to smaller companies um, because the numbers just aren't big enough. And I think certainly when it comes to things like gap investing or you know invest obviously isn't available at a european level but one thought i had and i don't know if this would ever be feasible or what the instrument through which you could achieve this would be 
is to set up a kind of European investment bank that specializes in film and television. And that mm -hmm. particular bank or entity, whatever you want to say it is, would be able to do the following things. It would be able to invest in, in development of a slate of projects if proposed by a company or a group of companies working together. It could invest in companies themselves by taking an mm -hmm. equity stake in companies and them to grow. It could also invest in, in the production, in produ production finance, however you look at that, whether it's gap finance or equity or whatever it is. Because the truth is in Europe, we, maybe not so much in television, certainly in cinema, we tap out at a very low level. So in other words, you know, if, if we're looking to find Yorgos Lanthimos's new movie, there's really no one, nowhere in Europe that can, invent, can finance that film. We inevitably go to America. We may get some of the money from Europe, but most of it is coming from outside of Europe. And I think it's a great shame that we can't provide homes in Europe for our filmmakers to do audacious, large-scale work. I mean, if you think of our heritage, the amazing filmmakers that we had that worked in Europe and made films that audiences wanted to see 20, 30, 40 years ago, we were able to do that, but we no longer seem to be able to do that. And I think that's a great shame. So I think, and, and these things have a real commercial value. And so the opportunity here is cultural, it's commercial, and it's economic. And the film and television industry, we're not looking for, you know, special treatment as a kind of industry that needs to be propped up. It's really saying, look, there's something really potentially very profitable here. There's huge demand for this, for what we make all around the world. And we're really missing a trick if we're not properly resourcing it, because by God, the Americans are properly resourcing it and the Chinese are properly resourcing it and the Indians are properly resourcing it, but we aren't, we're too fragmented and we're too small. Very interesting and inspirational perspective here, especially at a time where we have to stay hungry uh, to recover from crisis. And sometimes at times of crisis, again, uh, anger can actually be fostering and be, you know, like um, trying to get back um, to uh, where we started. So we have five minutes to go, uh, I'm being told. Um, and I would like to tackle one final point with you guys here, um, which also uh, made the news uh, this very morning here in Paris, um, group, um, television group Media One, uh, buying Lagardère Studios. And they have quite um, transparent ambition here, which is basically to tackle Netflix and any other platforms at trying to produce, de develop first, of course, uh, produce and distribute greater um, audiovisual content, which means that we also have concentration here in Europe. Uh, what um, have the independent producers um, have to say about this uh, big news and being, um, you know, uh, um, an ecosystem where uh, in Europe concentrations also happened? Marco, I see you want. Yes. Well, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of uh, Media One. I know the, um, the owners. I think that they out of uh, uh, they were very um, smart in um, uh, uh, raising money from the, the market uh, to create a, um, a solid uh, industrial group um, with the. Uh, uh, production uh, at, the, at the center and international distribution uh, uh, attached to that. And it makes sense that they go um, around Europe to buy um, whatever companies are still, the best of the companies that are still left after this uh, huge uh, 10 years of uh, merger and acquisition uh, uh, frenzy that uh, has uh, touched most of the uh, TV production company and some of the film companies. Um, it's definitely an example of uh, how European uh, um, Europeans can, uh, you know, make it work. Um, I still believe, however, that uh, no matter how sizable this uh, uh, venture will eventually be, uh, then you, when you produce at a local level for the streamers or for the broadcasters, uh the um, uh, playing field is not leveled there is always uh, uh, a strong uh, leverage from the part of the commissioning entities 
uh, and that's exactly why in the past, um, you know, especially in France, uh, uh, there was a robust regulation that allowed uh, producers to retain uh, the rights, uh, could not grant uh, the rights, the broadcasters could not um, acquire rights for longer than a, a limited period of, uh, of time. Uh, all things that they have uh, uh, benefited the French industry have helped uh, creating um, uh, larger French uh, champions, so to speak. And some of them have uh, been made to very interesting then for acquisition. Um, I think, uh, although I'm a, at heart very much a free marketeer, I think that uh, when the level playing field is when the playing field is not level, uh, you need to um, um, work on uh, regulations. And uh, and again, going back to what we we're saying, also um, the streamers, Netflix, Amazon, now Disney Plus, they provide uh, a lot of investment in the market. So that will help the industry very much. But um, I think that. Uh, if a lot of those the producers that work with them and with the broadcasters can um, have uh, can be treated uh, in a in a, in a way that is more consistent with the role of independent producer. So again, keeping part of the IP, uh, being remunerated, not be forcefully uh, detached from uh, for subsequent seasons uh, um, as sometimes they are required to of, of their work. I think that can over the years uh, create a. a, a a healthier um, ecosystem, as you um, as you defined it earlier. Yeah, and that sums up perfectly the entire discussion. I'm so sorry we'll have to stop here as we're coming to an end for this European Film Forum online for the very first time here at Le Marché du Film. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your perspective. Uh, I guess we could you know go on for another thirty minutes uh, debating how we can reshape and reboost the European uh, Union um, um, ecosystem when we it comes to creative industries. Let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that the recording of this EFF will be available uh, on the Digital Single Market YouTube channel, and that, of course, the European Film Forum still is on uh, until the very end of the Marché du Film Online 2020. The showcases are taking place um, from um, tomorrow, actually, June the 23rd, and until June the 26th at 5 p.m. every single day. A lot uh, will be uh, going on, as you can see. And of course, thank you so much for attending this European here behind your screens. I hope we'll see you again in real life sometime soon. But as for it right now, let's be agile, let's be resilient, and let's come at one audiovisual ecosystem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.